It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again, time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 330. Tonight I'm joined by Ammo. Hello. Ashkar. That's not a prime number. Kodra. There once was a boat named the Belly of Tea. <laughs> CKTs <laughs> for live. Tam. Uh, oh, hello. Hey. Hey, Phelan. Hello. See, all that makes me think of is the uh, the drunken sailor alteration they made for Dishonored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to that again, and oh boy. That was and pretty clear I, that I remembered. Like, I... I, I I enjoy sea shanties. I just don't understand why the rest of the world does right now. I mean, uh, they're great. They're because... great. And TikTok has a functionality that lets you respond to other TikToks. And so we are TikToks all the way downing into like big, big collaborative group sea shanties. Yeah. Because, because sea shanties were invented to be sung when you're stuck in a small location with the same people <laughs> day in and day out waiting and hoping for the day when you can actually go out and party. I mean, and they were also designed to be listened to while you did other things. So. Yes. Well, I mean, they were written initially, they were designed to help keep time while doing various jobs. So yep. we but live yeah. in interesting times. Like I saw someone on Twitter going really in depth into like, so what would space chanties, space chanties <laughs> be? And it was really cool. Know. But that maybe should have existed on Firefly. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure Warframe made one. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It I, really is true. I mean, that was more of a union labor song. I'm going to I'm gonna go out of a limb and suggest that but they're the, very similar. The gap between union labor songs and sea shanties is pretty thin. Oh, yes. It's incredibly small. So uh, we've got a long list of things. I know we won't make it through most of them but like a lot of these are just random topics um also uh, the, the top one riot is making an mmo apparently this was uh pre-christmas news yeah so i i have long said that league of legends is a setting that i find interesting but a game that i don't want to play I mean, yeah. and then they announced a whole bunch of other genres that they're building games in. Yeah. Now an MMO. So sweet. R- Rune Terra is a kind of ideal MMO world in that lots of people know very broad strokes about it, but the company still controls it completely. I mean, I feel like probably as much information is known about Runeterra as was Azeroth before WoW was created. Yeah, well, probably less, I feel, because there were some games set in Azeroth. Yeah, but like, I also feel, Mm. I kind of feel like prior to World of Warcraft 3, there (laughs) was a lot of general lore direction, but like not a lot of actual story happening in Azeroth. Uh, I'd say Warcraft 2 had a decent chunk of story. Yeah. But I I feel like Warcraft 2 had enough story to keep itself from falling apart. I mean, that's also true of Warcraft 3 to be totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was memorable and we've been mining it ever since. Yep. I mean, a good chunk of why why it was memorable is because they started working on an adventure game. I mean, and, you know, threw that away. They but also yeah. had like it was much more character focused. Yeah. I'm forever sad that they never made that adventure game. I mean, they've released a lot of segments of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, you know, animated cutscenes and things. Yeah. Like, I, I think it would have been a artifact of its time. Like, I don't think it, like, say they released it tomorrow. I don't think it would hold up at well, all. No. I mean, aren't they all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We played Full Throttle collectively, not, yeah. I mean, okay, that was several years ago now, but even so. Yeah. Full Throttle was good. Like, it was it, still rather enjoyable. Oh, yeah. It for I feel like some of you had played Full Throttle and were able to play it and enjoy it, and some of us were like, oh, these are some 90s puzzles. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. I guess 
nostalgia goes a long way yeah. in smoothing over <laughs> and spackling the problems. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, and, and, and at the time, it was much more streamlined and sensible than things that had come before. True. Well, yeah, like, and that's the thing is like, I can absolutely think of, uh, you know, 3D platformer rules circa the PS1 era. Uh oh. And if, and if, <clears throat> get out your crock, get out your busby. Right. And like, <laughs> but, and yeah, like if you tried, if you try to pick one of those up right now, it's a disaster. But if you were playing them at the time, yeah, it felt natural because that's what all of the games were doing. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, in in 10 years, we're going to be like, oh, man, I don't what last hits. Oh, right. That's a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, like, but I already think that. Yeah, we're kind of there now. But like, if you were in the depths of, you know, the original Dota, then, yeah, it just feels natural. I mean, hell, you have. If you if I told you right now I'm going to make a game where your entire combat is menu sequences, you'd be like, I'm really? Ask you why you revived FF11? I mean, not just FF11. <laughs> I mean, FF's one through eleven. Oh well. I mean, I'm playing Yakuza oh. Seven right now. I was going to say, is Yakuza Seven that? <laughs> right. And yeah, but it's also like it's intentionally doing a kind of throwback thing. I mean, alternately, if you had told me. If you had told me in 1997 that we were going to be playing a Final Fantasy with full, uh, full real time RPG combat, I would have been like, I don't understand how you could possibly do that. <laughs> like, yeah, like how how would that even be Final Fantasy anymore? How would it even work? I don't even know how you would. How would you? I don't have enough buttons. Well, I remember I was completely overwhelmed when I first played Diablo. Yeah. Like, how is this real time? This is madness. There's uh, so much clicking. I don't even know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a certain amount of, uh, Bell and I were talking the other, a little earlier about how, thanks to the slightly different directions from which we came to, uh, video games, we have completely different, like we treat our game controllers completely differently. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were talking about joysticks and like, because I came from joysticks out of the arcade, I tend to mash the joystick into the corner so I can feel the gate so I know exactly what direction I'm locked into. Like, I don't suddenly yeah. move a, a joystick. Like, like it is it is all the way over so that I can tell where in the octagon it's going to be. And God forbid, if it's not an octagonal gate, it confuses the hell out of me. Yeah. Isn't Whereas, like, square tam- gate, aren't square gates common for Japanese games? They are, but mm-hmm. not in American arcades. That's fair. And the first thing I do when I get a new uh, fight stick is I buy an octagonal gate and replace it. I uh, I grew up on flight sims. If at any point, if at any point I have pushed a stick to the point where it touches the side of the like the limit of its thing, I know I've gone way too far. Yeah. And if I ever do do so, if for any reason I've done so with such force that it makes a sound of any kind, like that little tap, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm go, I'm too much, way too much. Like I never touch the sides of the like a, in a, on an analog stick on a controller. I never touch the side of the the analog stick like boundary. Suddenly I want analog sticks with like diagonal gates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually but, terrible on fight sticks because they they I feel like I'm going to break the thing. Right. And you and you basically <laughs> have to bump around the edge to do any rolling attacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't I can't do them. I was I mean my comment to Bell was like the the cartwheel jump in Mario 64, where you've got to be running in one direction and then slam the stick in the other direction and jump at the same time. I can't do it. I'm terrible yeah. at it. Yeah, whereas I played a lot of Guile. That's all his moves are slamming yep. from one side to the other. <laughs> But the, the we also talked about, like, on the mouse side, we're probably not that different because I leave my mouse super sensitive so that, like, I can maybe move a quarter of an inch and it goes all the way across the screen. But what's interesting, though, is, like, we had this conversation as well, is, like, there's so much of gaming literacy that is very hard to teach and... This kind of goes into, like, I'm going to use this as a segue into the next topic. Um, So once upon a time, games 
mostly premiered in an arcade. And Mm -hmm. while you didn't have a quarter in the machine, arcade games would play this little sequence called an attract sequence. The thing is, like, those attract sequences actually provide tutorialization of the game. Yeah. And I didn't realize it at the time, but, like, if you think about it, the intro to Super Mario Brothers, if you just leave it play, it tells you everything you need to know in a few seconds on how to play that game. Yeah. First of all, Mario goes the wrong way, hits the edge. Mario goes the other way, and and now the screen moves. Mario dies to a Goomba. Mario tries again. Mario hits a block. Mario steps on a Goomba. Like, it's basically a sequence of events that's telling the player how to play the game. And I remember, like, after thinking about that, almost all those arcade games were the same way. Oh, yeah. Like, Magician Lord. You know, I've seen that intro so many times. It basically shows you the buttons that you're supposed to be hitting. And the weird thing is, I tutorialization in games has always annoyed the hell out of me. But it's because I come into games with a certain package of knowledge on how they function. Attract screens were kind of a sneaky way of telling you something about the game without actually telling you something about the game. And I don't know if it was the PlayStation era or when it was that a track screen stopped happening. Because like I remember a lot of Nintendo era games had them. Some Super Nintendo games had them. But like I remember, especially during the PlayStation era, having some pretty logo as the screen that comes up. And then that's it. And like you have to hit start before you get any of the game. Yeah, we basically ultimately transitioned to like if if there is something, it's like a, you know, an animated cutscene, like a CGI. Right, right. Know. Almost like usually it's like a little a little music video. <laughs> yeah. So I mean it it makes me think of it makes me think of um the like tut- uh, tutorials in general have this thing going on where they're absolutely vital and because if you if a game drops you in and doesn't give you a tutorial, hello Crusader Kings two, uh, <laughs> you know hello hello honestly far too many board games etc then it's really easy to get frustrated and check out because you're like i don't really even if i can press even if i can perform actions and make things happen i don't really understand how to play this game but if i'm sitting there and i'm like okay i understand how to play this let me play that's really frustrating like the tutorial is super frustrating because you're like okay i get it yes i know how to move a mouse (laughs) right but yeah. not everyone does. Right, exactly. And that and that's kind of the hard mental state to get in is like, okay, I have been doing this since longer than I can remember. Like, I remember playing Pong when I was, I don't know, four or five, something like that. And you, you pick like, up a controller and instantly know how to hold it. Right, exactly. Like, it's, you have a, not even that you know how to hold it, you have a favored way of holding it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's been one of the things as I've been sitting in VR, which has a completely different set of controllers where I'm like, oh, wait a second. I, I need to, I, I'm bringing a bunch of controller knowledge to this, but like the way I think about looking around and moving around is fundamentally different. And I had a, I had a super frustrating like 10 minutes earlier today when I was trying to remap um half-life alex controls because one of the defaults um because because the teleport the like the vr hop around teleportation thing is really jarring and actually makes me more ill than smooth motion i try to turn it off but it's necessary because it's also how you jump um so i needed to rebind it because on the right stick of the right hand control on the right hand controller stick if you press down um it teleports it like brings up the teleport interface and when you let go it teleports you to where you aimed at but it's also how i how i turn my body left and right so uh so i kept running into this into this thing where i'd get into a into a you know firefight with a bunch of combine be like trying to duck behind cover and instead teleport into the middle of the field and die 
and it's super annoying. So I was like, okay, how do I rebind this button? And then you bring up the like interface for remapping and it's and I like, okay, I have a hard time even following this because it's not a control scheme that it's not, it's not controllers or a control scheme. That's something that I'm, that's like instantly intuitive to me, but it's clearly designed by somebody for whom it is. Cause they've been working on it forever. And I see somebody, you know, I see somebody, uh, you know, pick up a, pick up a controller and try to do the move with one stick, look with the other. And it's just, it's just not possible. Like they just, it's just not something anybody, not something they understand unless you've been doing it for years. Yeah. Well, and in, in VR, you're fighting two separate problems. One, you are getting used to this. Two, VR is not a solved problem yet. Right. Like mm-hmm. when when we're talking about controller movement or mouse and keyboard movement, there is a solved problem that has been reached sometime during the late 2000s. And now every game has that that interface. And I get real frustrated when I play anything that doesn't use that interface. Yeah. Because, like, this is the default best way to control games that has been decided upon collectively. Um, but, like, VR doesn't have that. Like, this is still a new frontier of people trying to figure out how the hell do you, you know, try and replicate real-world movement in a game that is also giving you the illusion that it is taking place in a 3D space. Like a fully 3D space. Yeah. Well, and I think about things like the, um, like when the N64 came out, which had this radical idea of what if you put a joystick on a controller? Mm-hmm. And like they did. And people were like, what is this hot nonsense? This is Nintendo being crazy. Well, I mean, we had the NES it, Advantage all the way back in the, the 8 bit, and it was fantastic. But that was the thing you had to actively go out and, and seek. Uh, right. I, I, I kind of need to say one pretty notable flaw with the N64 controller is that we don't have three Why? hands. <laughs> I mean, but you never it needed three hands. hands. You never needed three hands, but it made it super odd. Like, like, what is going on with this controller? How do I even hold this? Yeah. It yeah. took some getting used to. Like, you, you were like, oh, I hold it my left hand holds the middle section and this left section just sits over here doing nothing. Yeah. Cause, cause they weren't, they were, weren't a hundred percent sure that the idea would work. And so they didn't want to overcommit. And within a generation, it was like, Nope, mm-hmm. sticks on everything. Yep. I mean, I feel like the Nintendo 64 controller was a tech demo and the GameCube controller was the production model. Because, like, a GameCube controller is doing a thing, basically the same thing that the Nintendo 64 controller was doing, but better. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, that make the DualShock the production model? Yeah, I think of I mean, the DualShock yeah, as the production yeah. model. Well, because cause going, from, going from, like, the old school PlayStation controller to the DualShock was a massive upgrade. Yeah, that was a big jump. Because, like, I didn't remember how bad those first PlayStation controllers were until I got the PlayStation Mini, mm-hmm. and that's what it comes with. And they're yep. largely unplayable. I mean, I remember getting really excited about the Rumble Pack. Oh, yeah. I mean, Rumble is also another feature that was debuted in the N64 and then made standard. Yep. yep. And it turns out haptic feedback is great. Mm-hmm. I wish we did more I, with it, but... I mean... I'm sad that of... the whole haptic feedback mouse didn't catch on yeah i i still don't I'm even more sad it. about the steam controller yeah I, that's yeah although admittedly really owning rumble. one hmm? i still don't really get rumble like it's not a value add to me it really like i expected the playstation 5 to be the one that changed my opinion if the switch didn't oh, change your man. opinion the ps5 probably wasn't going to no hey, hey no, bell hey bell just... you know that thunderclap sound you know that thunderclap sound that you're so used to that lets you know that you got all the mobs? In what? In WoW. Like when you're a warrior and you thunderclap. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an audio cue that you just know off the, that you can like hear in your sleep. Overpower okay. on a warrior in FF14 is probably a better one. Okay. Yeah, there yeah. you go. That one. Haptic feedback is that, but for touch instead of hearing. Yeah. Okay. I think I just don't have sensitive enough touch. Yeah, maybe... Because yeah, yeah like touch, touch feedback is fantastic for me. Like I, yeah, like that 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 connects like straight to the straight to my brain. 
Yep. Like, don't even have to think about it. It lets me know that something's happening. Yeah. And some, and there are, it's very clever the way, like, sometimes it's like, wait, why is my controller shaking? And then suddenly it starts shaking more. And then I start realizing something bad is about to happen. Like screen shake for me is more of a meaningful interaction I, than, uh, ha- than rumble. Yeah, but st- well, st- I, screen shake interferes with me playing the game. Yeah, I hate Rumble interferes shake. with me playing the game. Rumble <laughs> throws my aim off. Screen shake throws my aim off. Yeah. Rumble doesn't Rumble yeah. doesn't hurt it at all. Absolutely. I this I'm on Games have options menus. Yeah. And it, they absolutely should because like that it's totally reason in both cases totally reasonable. Yeah. It's like I never understood how anybody could play WoW while listening to music. Because so much of me playing that game is audio cues. Yeah, for me it was mostly visual cues. I create crafted my own audio cues for a while. Like the only real audio cue that I that I have to have now is an add-on called GTFO <laughs> that plays this horrible <laughs> klaxon anytime you're standing in bad. Like it is really annoying. And it is unsubtle, and it is enough for me to realize, oh, crap, I clipped into an area of effect. Uh, I just remember all of the random little uh, noises that would play from deadly boss mods. Mm-hmm. I will say my my experience of, oh, man, video games are asking people to do so much was... Uh, introducing my wife to wow and just watching her the the control scheme for every mmo is not that intuitive is what i would say i mean it asks you to it asks you to know it asks you to understand to already intuitively understand mouse look and right. intuitively understand WASD movement and intuitively understand attaching a hot bar to WASD so that you can do things and intuitively understand holding and not holding your right click to look versus interface with the, it's like, yeah, it's yeah. so many layers, it's so you, many layers. Well, and it's all stuff that we learned a single element at a time. Yeah. yeah. These things got like introduced in here and there in different games and we just, yeah, but this Got is where this uh, is where I I get really concerned. Like, ha, are we just making games for people who grew up in our age band? Yes. And how do we make how do we make it so that the next generation can play games? Mm-hmm. So here's the here's the other piece of that. One the one answer is Nintendo, because Nintendo <laughs> Nintendo is like is doggedly pursuing the we want to create new game players um and the other one is that like right now in my 30s if i run into something with an obtuse control scheme i'm like f this i can do something else right when i was seven Uh uh-huh i would when i was seven i played lagoon right like i also (laughs) played the hell out of lagoon and loved it because I spent money on a game. I wasn't going to get any more money for a really long time. I'm right. going to make this one work. You know, I, as a seven year old, I'm like, I got a lot of, I have way more free time than I have different games I could play. Mm-hmm. I'm going to figure it out. Like, yeah, it's going to be hard and I'm going to be terrible at it. But this is, this is why my big thing is like, games need to give you a space where you can play with the controls and start to understand them before you're thrown into the pit of sharks that is playing with other people. Oh, God, yes. I, oh, yeah. I almost feel like we need... Thomas was alone, but for gaming mechanics. Yeah. Because, like, Land? Thomas, Thomas was alone was, like, it, it basically built upon layer after layer after layer of things, slowly introducing you to one new concept at a time, and, like, it did a really good job of that. But we need that for, like just general control mechanics like okay you know so we're gonna we're gonna use wasd for a while and then we're gonna throw in some basic mouse clicks and then we're gonna mouse look (laughs) but like figuring out a way to turn that into an enjoyable gaming experience do do you mean thomas was alone or evo land (laughs) i mean thomas was alone because like i remember like it changed the puzzle just slow enough 
to where you could adapt uh, to okay. the new, the mm-hmm. new pieces with their movement types. And it told you a really nice story around it. So I know I've, I've been seeing this with my son cause I've, you know, he's, he's three now and I've actually like can make the connection between things he does with the controller and stuff that happens on the, on the screen and just watch watching him pick things up. It's, it makes me realize how many of these things like I just took for granted, but also oh, yeah. like he picks the stuff up really quick, honestly. And in part, it's because kids will just push all the buttons to see what they do. <laughs> We've learned not to do that, but he, he will do this thing and maybe maybe it ends up not doing what he wanted to do. But, you know, he, he sees that and he learns it and he carries on. What what games are you finding work well with that? So so we've been we've been playing Katamari Damacy, um, which you know took a little to get him used to the whole twin stick thing. But he's he's got it at least to the point that he can he can roll the ball forward and turn and you know go up and down hills and things and pick stuff up, which is more than enough to keep him entertained. He thinks the mice are hilarious. Like I'll I'm I'm really annoyed that that game will not let you back into the initial non-timed uh, tutorial yes. level without yes. starting over completely. Because I hate uh, having to speed through that first bit to get him to that. Because the because he's not going to finish the level within the time limit. And he no. doesn't know what to do once he's out of the level. I just want him to be able to run around in there until he gets bored. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that is something, too. Like, games used to have... or were way more common just to have a free play mode that didn't have any of the timing or anything associated with it. I know like, God, what was it? 720 was a skating game that I loved Mm -hmm. and I never played the, the real mode. I just ran around in, in free play or Tony Hawk. I always just ran around in free play. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't care about like the achievement side of the game. I just wanted to skate and do things and free play was what gave me that option. I was going to say my, my problem is games are either too complex or uh, too prone to failure states Mm -hmm. Uh, and trying to find games that are like engaging and not complex. Like I was really excited for animal crossing because that seemed like it'd be right up the alley, but he was, he was not interested. Yeah. But like, uh, yeah, I keep looking for that style of game to get my son involved with and it's... like so so far the ones he's really into are that and uh goose game he does yeah my son does like goose game i'm actually uh i keep meaning to go through and look at what's available in the uh the old nintendo and super nintendo games on the switch to see if any of those leap out at me as ones that he might like because you know graphics quality in that isn't going to be a real issue yeah this is incidentally why i'm Street, never, he has no taste this is incidentally why i'm never sad about all of the like nintendo's re-released mario brothers 3 again yeah no like but good good mario brothers <laughs> 3 was great but even mario but brothers 3 it. is it's a it's a hill to climb because like you're gonna get a pit right in front of you really quick that you're gonna need to be able to run move and jump over Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, and it, go, it goes back to the like, as a kid, yeah, I'm going to die on that pit for hours, but I'm going to have a pretty fun time doing it because, you know, when I press, when I press the buttons here, stuff happens there. That's awesome. So there's a part of this conversation that Tam and I started. I, I don't remember what the, the root of it was, but one of the things I brought up was there's this video and I forget who it's by and what the name is. But basically, he's a YouTuber, and his wife said, hey, can I try the cute ghost game as a non-gamer? And he finally realized she's talking about Hollow Knight. (laughs) And she wanted to play Hollow Knight, but like she had none of the requisite knowledge of just how that world works. So like Mm -hmm. that first little sequence where you've got like, a very small section of staggered blocks that you have to jump across. Anyone that's ever done a 3D platformer was through that in seconds. Yeah. That probably took 30 jumping, minutes. Probably jumping past 
stages cutting corners like, yeah right like yeah, I, like, like yeah, missing I, blocks and yeah like i learned how to do that stuff when i played Mega Man. right it took his wife 30 minutes and every time she would make a jump it was like exaltation yeah. that she landed it and and then she would carefully stage the next jump only to fall and then <laughs> have to do it all over again Again, that reminds me very much of how, how it went when I was learning to do this stuff playing Mega Man. Mm-hmm. Holy God, getting through the first part of Guts Man's stage took me forever. I mean, I, one of I the don't know how long it took me to beat Frost Man's stage in Mega Man 8 the first time. I, I, remember, uh, I remember playing, having never played a Mega Man game before, playing Mega Man X and being excited to get through the first level without having lost any lives. It's hard to lose lives in the intro to Mega Man X. <laughs> the if tutorial have, area? The what? Yeah, the, the tutorial area, like on the highway. It's pretty hard to die, but you could do it. <laughs> Later versions of that made it way easier to die. <laughs> like, they repeat that level in multiple other Mega Man games. Yeah, to their detriment, I think, that it's harder. I mean, at, at that point, it's not a tutorial level anymore, so it's, I think, okay for it to be harder. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. But in the case, like, I don't know, I'm thinking of the, there was the, like, remake of Mega Man X, where it feels like they zoomed way in on everything. And so, like, the field of view is way smaller. I mean, the SNES field of view is pretty tiny. It's fair. If you, like, I have it, I find it difficult to go back past X4 for that reason, which was the first one on the PlayStation. Oh, yes, my son also loves (laughs) Pac-Man. Although a lot of times when he tells us he wants to play Pac-Man, he means he wants to get a silicone pot holder and chase us in circles around the couch going waka waka. <laughs> I was uh, I was trying out a thing that released recently that is uh, Pac-Man on Echo Show. How does that work? It's got voice controls. Huh. You, Weird. You can say various combinations of waka and wiki and various things you you make you make pac-man sounds to move around in directions okay that's awesome oh my gosh and it's i I don't want to play this but i want a video of you playing it it's actually i mean what i actually want to play now is the echo show version of patapon it would work yes and it was one of those things it's like i i mostly i loaded it up because i was like all right how on earth does this, this work? Is nonsense. Like, am I going to put my cradle, the like entire device in my hands? But no, I don't even touch the device. And it, I, I found the tutorial a little bit over, over, um, overprotective, over, uh, not the word I'm looking for, overbearing. Like, like I, I wanted to be like, okay, I understand what I'm doing. Let me just let me play. But like, also, I'm not the target audience for that game. <laughs> that that's another thing that that kind of annoys me is a lot of times when a game does tutorialization like you're locked into the tutorial mode like you can either skip it or you have to do it all and there's no mm-hmm. in between like sometimes it's cool to do a tutorial just for a refresher but like after a few minutes you remember and you need to you can exit out but no a lot of times it makes you complete the sequence yeah Okay, so I'm reordering those a little bit because I think this is going to be really short. Um, I was thinking back to the Super Nintendo era, and there's two racing games by Nintendo that I loved, Mario Kart and F-Zero, except for Nintendo has largely forgotten that F-Zero exists. I know. I was trying to think why, because to me, of the two of them, F-Zero is infinitely superior to Mario Kart. Yes, Samurai Goro for life. Samurai Goro for life. Uh, but uh, I, I, the reason, I object to that statement, but we'll get there. But, <laughs> but I, I know why they bet their money on Mario Kart because, because Mario F Zero is a single player experience. So for the most my, part, F Zero is a single player experience. Mario Kart is this group party game experience. The original F Zero, yes, is single player, but the second one was on the sixty four, and that was the first one I played. Mm-hmm. And that was that's not that's not a single player game. Was it split screen? Yep. Okay. And same for the GameCube. That said, was it any both good? of those games? Yeah, they're very good. Okay, good. But uh, sure. both of those games are highly technical. Yes. Yep. It is difficult to play them with somebody who is not overly familiar with everything about them already. 
and have anything resembling an even match. Yep. Whereas Mario Kart is much more party game, so yeah, a hundred percent. You can pick it up, and it's like it's a it's a fun, uh, like immersive game experience that involves like various other power ups and stuff, and like there's things about Mario Kart that make it fun that aren't directly the game. It's the yeah. interactions. Yeah. I, I, and all I the and all the people who want a technical racing game are overplaying like Gran Turismo and stuff. I, I yeah. think that the Sad. I, I think that the uh the cleverest addition to Mario Kart in years is the mostly the game drives for you mode that you can put carts into. I love it so much. Like it's such a good idea. It means that I can play this game with my son and I can be like, hey, you should definitely be using items because that's really the most important thing for you to do. And yeah, the game will finish and he'll be excited and he gets to see all of the cool levels and he has his favorite level. And it doesn't matter. And like seeing what order people come in doesn't matter. He's like, whatever, I'm. Did I press buttons and was it fun? That's the important thing. I mean, I don't know. I assume that this is the case. I don't know for sure. Your your child may be a uh, like a, a hyper competitive Mario Karter, but I just wish Nintendo had not forgotten that F Zero exists, and I wish that whoever published Wipeout did not forget that Wipeout existed. Sony, but that studio's gone. Honestly, the last Captain Falcon gets to be in Smash, I guess. That is not so, a consolation prize. <laughs> Mario Kart's, sorry, F Zero GX, the GameCube one, was mostly made by Amusement Visions, which is, I think, part of Sega now. They make Monkey Ball, among other things. Yeah, because they also did an arcade game at the same time that was like F Zero AX. AX, yeah. I so I uh, I gotta say, I think I think that F Zero. And and similarly, wipe out. I think they were trying to be too technical. I feel like I feel like if you want technical, you're getting into like you know Forza, like you said. But I, I don't want real. I don't want real. That's the thing. I I want I want games to exist kind of like that, but I don't want real. Right. Like what I want. Like what I want is burnout. I want burnout. I mean, I'll take burnout. Zero. Burnout is not very real. Right. Yeah, but like I don't want to race cars. Like I want to race something other than a car. Yeah. Like yeah. I would I would love to play Burnout's racing mode, but but it's F0. That would be yeah. so awesome. Like there's this we've talked about this before, but like there's this arcade racer niche that is more technical than Mario Kart, but less technical than Forza. Forza Horizon is it, supposed to be in that niche. Yeah, but it's not there. It, I don't know. For whatever reason, Forza, do, Forza Horizon doesn't do anything to me. Um, but like, there's there used to be a lot of those games, and now they don't exist. Like the cruising USA type games were kind of that game. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've historically been very unsuccessful. Blur had a bit of an issue along with uh, what was it called, Split Second, and that they came out at the same time and got confused for each other. So neither one of them sold terribly well. But things like MotorStorm is a dead series. F- uh, F-Zero is basically a dead series. Uh, Wipeout is a dead series. Extreme G is not a thing I've heard from since the PS2, I want to say. People just didn't buy them. Uh, that makes me sad, though. I like things that apparently nobody else likes. I mean, a lot of arcade racers, like a lot of the draw was the controls. And obviously you don't have those on a console release. Well, and, and to be fair, a lot of the reasons why we played the console version is because we liked it playing it on the arcade and it gave us the closest possible home experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I love Cyber Sled in the arcade, which was like a sort of mech shooter thing. And I played it on the PlayStation, even though it wasn't anywhere near as good, just because I remembered like it in the arcade. <laughs> yeah. Again, something VR could do for us. Okay, so we've got this experimentation of Mario topic. So I've been playing... I got a bunch of different Mario stuff for Christmas. Uh, I got the Mario Legos. I got uh, Mario Kart Home Circuit. 
And I also watched the trailer for Super Mar- Super Nintendo World. And it's very interesting to me. Like, I mean, I guess Mario's always been game, f- like, the property that they will do experimental stuff with. But they're mm-hmm. really pushing some experimental stuff right now. Mario Kart Live is fascinating. And I'm, I don't know if you've seen the videos, but Super Nintendo World looks amazing. Like going to be going around with AR bands on your wrist and doing various activities. Yeah, I'm, I'm no, really interested in the good. idea. But I think the most impressive one is Mario Kart Live, which lets you put down uh, cardboard uh, gates that you need to drive your car through in order. And so you have a little RC car that has a camera attached to the back that feeds into your switch. And so you control the RC car with your switch, but the switch also gets to control the RC car. And that means that there is a layer of software between you and your car. And that's where stuff like mushrooms can happen. And Oh, if you use a mushroom, now your car goes faster. Or if you use power slide, your car corners faster. Or if you get blue sparks, your car will get a boost of speed. Or if you hit a banana, your car will careen out of control. And when you layer the virtual obstacles over top of the physical obstacles of the space you live in, it leads to a really interesting uh, race experience. Like, I'm really scared of bananas because they might send me off into the post of a couch, at which point I have to, like back up and get myself going so that I'm not going to run into a physical couch again. Hmm. Uh, There's also a multiplayer mode, which sounds like utter madness, where you can have up to four carts careening around the same space, interacting with each other, like shooting shells at each other, and just causing general mayhem. It's, uh, It's really cool and it's really fun. Sounds like something that pets would make extra complicated. Uh, pets are pets are terrified of the carts. Kids make it complicated. <laughs> <That too. laughs> but it's really fun when, like, you just they see on the big screen themselves careening towards the cart as this giant monster. All I can think of is I want to be big. <laughs> I mean, compared to the cart, you are, and then you get to see yourself on screen. Yep, kids are always into that. Also, its profile is really fun for, like, identifying the obstacles you can just barely squeak under. (laughs) So does the game institute, like, checkpoints along the track? Or can you completely short-circuit the established track? You have to go go through the four gates. Okay. But other than that, you can short-circuit the established track. And sometimes it's not a bad idea to build in some uh, shortcuts, because... Uh, it turns out the AI doesn't care about your chair, and they'll just drive right through it, and that might give them an advantage. Uh. <laughs> I feel like this would be really cool um, with the DualSense controller, since it has the whole, like, button locking. That way, when you're, like, in a skid or whatever, you can, like, literally lock the controls up. I mean, you kind of want to be quickly correct. Like, again, if... What it really does feel like is it feels like playing Mario Kart in in AR. Like it like the courses I'm on feel like a Mario Kart course and it's really cool that way. So, I'm not really sure on this next topic how much I actually have to say, but one of the things I did over the break was start Jedi Fallen Order from scratch and then proceed to like beat it in 2 days. First of all, that's a freaking great game. If you've never played that game, you should play it. I played it on easy because I didn't want the full um, Dark Souls experience. I just wanted it <laughs> to be a fun narrative adventure. Um, and I've probably cheated myself out of something, but I don't care. I was mostly there for the Star Wars story and feeling like a Jedi. Uh, but like, the thing that I did different this time is when I first played it, I was trying to play it on a controller. And that's fine, but, like, I am not, 
I'm not super comfortable with controllers from the start. And that game asks you to do a bunch of different things in sequences. And I wondered, oh, hey, if I'm going to restart it, I wonder if it's playable with mouse and keyboard. And it is absolutely playable with mouse and keyboard. In fact, I found it way easier with a mouse and keyboard. And I like in this realm that we live in where Disney Plus has made series out of everything, since those characters are based on real people that exist in the world, I, I really want to see a Jedi Fallen Order series that like either is a side adventure or like picks up after the events of the first game. I think that would be really cool. Yes. Also, like there's a lot of character development that happens in that game that like there's a lot of evolving of the characters that I really like. I really like that game. Yeah, BD-8 was great. He's the best droid. It's the best dog ever. <laughs> B- BD-1 is is basically like, yeah. is basically just like a puppy dog. Like it's puppy dog in robot form. And so I K-9. love the K- well, no, like like K9 <laughs> K9 was nowhere near as interactive as BD-1. Uh it's true. Um but like BD-1 is like your buddy. Like you go on adventures with with and, you know, does interesting things and acts as the Zelda element to the game. <laughs> or at least one of the Zelda elements to the game. And, like, at the beginning of this, we were talking about how, you know, games introduce concepts slowly sometimes. I really appreciate the way that this game eased you into the gameplay experience. So, like, there's a lot of Zelda-style or Metroidvania type interactions where you gain this ability, this ability now unlocks new areas on places you've already been to. Um, But like it puts these things in sequences and it introduces them slow enough that by the time you have to chain like three abilities in a row to make it across somewhere. Yeah. Like it's easier. Like it, it, it feels natural at that point because you've done versions of that enough times i also greatly appreciate how when you fail a jump the game basically just resets to the nearest location to where you you failed yeah so like there were a lot of sequences that you had to do like while sliding down an ice bridge where you have to like you know, grab something midair as you're 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 at a specific point. And those felt significantly less frustrating when I knew that, oh, hey, I'm just going to reset to a few minutes ago and I'll nail it this time. I mean, and, and sometimes a few seconds ago, it's like, oh, whoops, right. I yeah. messed that up. Let's just just do it right again. Yeah, but it's a freaking great game. Like I I greatly appreciate um, revisiting it with more comfortable controls. Um, I, I think like, even when I've, I've had it suggested not to use a mouse and keyboard, I'm going to just try mouse and keyboard from the start because chances are I will appreciate it. <laughs> okay. This next topic, I have no clue where this is going. Genesis Shadowrun and Cyberpunk. Yeah. So I think I've complained about it in the past. Uh, the current edition of Shadowrun 6th edition is a complete disaster. It really is. Um, it's very difficult to overstate how complete we're talking about by the way it yeah it's it, it's very upsetting quite frankly because it was yeah that's enough about shadow run anyway <laughs> genesis is fantasy flights generic is a genericization of their star wars system yes a system that does a fantastic job of letting you create a cinematic feeling experience yes and one of the things that they did was they wrote the they wrote some things for the Android setting, which is their their cyberpunk setting in the system. And hey, but it's their generic system, so they also have a bunch of magic things written for this system. <laughs> Turns out you can sort of just combine these and you can get Shadowrun out of their system. <laughs> nice. But like we had a b- bit of discussion about why are so many of the cyberpunk systems so terrible recently? Because what is it? Cyberpunk? What's the actual date on the game itself? 
I don't even remember. I, mean, I thought it was 2020. It, it, it was no, Cyberpunk 2020. No, that's the game. I think Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. Oh, you mean the the the, the, the video game? No, is 2077. no, I mean, damn it. No, the original, might... one, the original one was like Cyber... I, I think the original one was Cyberpunk 2020, and then it, it was, was. Cyberpunk I think the current one is Cyberpunk or Red. Yeah, Cyberpunk Red. They, they decided that putting a date on it was... Maybe not the best idea. ideas, yeah. yes. But that system is old. It's very old. It, it feels old, I mean, even it's the current old, one. It's old enough that when they created it, they thought 2020 was the year of the cyberpunk future. It's old. Yes, well. I mean, it's true. We're living in a cyberpunk future. It's not as cool as was advertised. Right. <laughs> well, we're living in a dystopian future. It's just not a cyberpunk future. I don't know. We're, we're, we're getting there. It's not punk enough. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We had discussion, like, we're trying to arrive at what cyberpunk systems actually exist that would be fun to play in. And it sounds like Genesis might be the most promising of them. This is the real, this yeah. is the real problem. And, and yeah, one of, like, one of the, one of the issues I have with it, because people are like, oh, I love Shadowrun, I love Shadowrun. And it's like, Shadowrun murders your players constantly. And yeah, you can have a thing where... Yeah. That's an interesting mechanic, but if you want to tell a narrative or have any kind of growth or anything other than a meat grinder, it's just not good for it. Yeah. Well, and mostly when people when people say they love Shadowrun, they mean they love the setting, they love the concepts. Right. And I do. I mean, I love both of those things. Yeah. Same here. There, there, like, there's there's a reason the Shadowrun system keeps changing because they've never had they've never had one that 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 completely worked. There's always there's always been at least something wrong. Seems I think fifth is an improvement on fourth, and I'm again very mad about sixth. Yeah, I honestly don't know how many times I've actually really played Shadowrun. A lot of times we we've, we've used Shadowrun as a source book and just kind of winged it in another system. Yeah, I mean, I would I was actually so I played uh, in a Star Wars game last night, and we were actually got on the subject of the Genesis system and the fact that the developers did such a good job, like making all of the stuff they, they created work together and also giving a lot of information on how to make your own things that are balanced and work with all the existing stuff. So yeah, it probably would work really well for Shadowrun. I mean, it almost works out of the box with Shadowrun, like two, two books and you basically got Shadowrun. Instant Shadowrun, just that magic. Yeah. I mean, the setting is different, but it's still very cyberpunky and treats a lot of things the same way or not very differently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why the the gonna play a cyberpunk RPG. It's gonna kill me all the time. Like thing got going because there's so many interesting stories that you just don't get to tell if you're dying all the time. Because if death is players are dead. Because death is cool and intense. It's for it's for adult gamers, not those not those kiddies. I guess, but Vampire the Masquerade exists. You know how hard <laughs> it is to die in VTM? I mean like invite a werewolf to your game. Sure. The trick. I feel like like the storyteller system is one of the most noob friendly game systems out there. It's great. Players. It's it's pretty reasonably so, yeah. I mean, it's good for players. It's not that terrible to DM unless you're trying to do something fight heavy because fight heavy is not what that system does well. No. And that's fine because there's a lot of other verbs and you can do a lot of other things in that game. Like it just gives you so many how do you want to how how do you want to solve this problem? It has really really good on the fly adaptive systems to just like your players ask you to do something completely bonkers. That's cool. You could probably gin up the roles necessary to determine whether or not that's successful. Yeah. I mean, if, if, Add if few you have stats, there are enough of them. If you want to fight heavy storyteller, you know, game like the Street Fighter role playing game exists. Wait, what? And was created because they needed a better combat system. That's Wait, what? Why it exists. You, you didn't know about that? No, White no Wolf I didn't. Got, White Wolf got the Street Fighter license back in the day. There is a Street Fighter role playing game, and it is it's, amazing. It's real That's rare. Too. It's is. so I have every book. It is so good. <laughs> it 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 absolutely uses the standard World of Darkness, like old World of Darkness storyteller system, 
Like it's, but it's got it's got its own combat system involving like basically moves with different speeds and like high low medium and and all that stuff. And it's and it actually works remarkably well. And there's a lot of times <laughs> that you just basically like play any of the games, but say, hey, we're gonna use the rules from this fighting game. Uh huh. Because, like, the same thing was true with uh, Palladium. Like, Palladium was a miserable fight system until one book got released called Ninjas and Super Spies. Yep. And then everybody just chose their martial art out of that book. Mm -hmm. Really, this has just opened my eyes more, a bit more to seeing the possibility of combinations of systems rather than using any of them trait. Mm -hmm. So it seems likely that that will be explored in the future. I mean, one of the things that, in a similar vein, one of the things that we've been talking about, because we talked about Lancer a bit back, and I really like the mech half of Lancer. <laughs> I think it's great. You've got really interesting, you've got really interesting combat, you've got really interesting, like, systems and customizations and pieces, and I mostly find that the part of the game where you're not in mechs falls pretty flat. Like, there's just not... There's not very much there, which is fine because what the because what the structure of the game wants you to do is, you know, battle tech style, do a do a little bit of overhead and then drop into a mission, go and do missions. And I think that works really well. But if I don't want to structure my game that way, it's sort of awkward. But also it I can graft the cyberpunk part of genesis onto lancer and it mostly just works so just a random comment i said white wolf street fighter was rare the cheapest one on ebay right now is 110 bucks for just the base book oh wow i need to take better care of those yeah <laughs> yeah and that's not for... the hard cover that's like the soft cover version for 110 i mean there weren't hard covers that oh they that, didn't that release I'm the nice of. one no, it, it was all just it was all just soft cover. It's all trade paper format. But yeah, for for the longest time, those were not difficult to get. <laughs> Clearly, that changed. People realized what what they had slept on. The brilliance. I am not sure we have enough time to break into the next topic. And given that we recorded a pretty long show last week, um, any final thoughts? I don't think so. Okay. Well. Hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.